Okay, so the, the main thing to say is, uh, is just welcome. This is an amazing occasion for Radical Anthropology Group. Radical Anthropology Group thinks of itself as London's longest running evening class. We've literally run for 40 years without interruption until rudely interrupted 18 months ago. Um, as you can see, we're, we're trying to keep in touch with the Zoom community that has been following uh, our schedule all through those 18 months. And this is the first time we've come back into UCL live to start things up and we're having a little trouble to integrate all the systems here. Um, so it is a, a fantastic celebration. Thank you for coming and thank you for being um, audience here. Uh, what I was also going to say is most of you will have seen this program. It's a, it's a very mixed and interdisciplinary program on the whole question of what it is to be human um, Chris is, we've got Chris doing the first couple of talks with classic rag topics on human evolution and he's going to tell you about radical anthropology um, because we needed to experiment with the system. And on October 5th we've got a really special occasion with our colleague Ian Watts who's over there with his notebook um, and the artist Anne Golifer who's coming from Botswana to do an exhibition in London. Um, and she has colleagues in Botswana that we hope we're going to be able to link to uh, across on Zoom as well. So we need to make these systems integrate properly by then. Um, all of these, we hope, are going to be in class. But I'm just going to point to two lectures, the 19th and the 26th, when our speakers, including Amy, who's here tonight, who's on the Zoom here tonight, um, Amy's over in the States. Uh, Valentina is over in Tunisia um, and because they're Zoom speakers we probably won't hold the class we'll do we'll go on Zoom um, but then myself I'm speaking on November 2nd and I expect to come and speak live but we're obviously going to be very flexible about what the situation is how successful it is and we're following UCL's guidelines UCL are going to review their guidelines October 22nd and who knows, they may be able to re release them somewhat more. Um, anyway, you've seen most of the, there's some very exciting speakers, including Chris Stringer. Um, we're going to be checking uh, Mona Finnegan. We hope she's coming from Edinburgh. Abby Page, Shana Lou Levy are leading young hunter-gatherer researchers, um, as well as Jerome Lewis, our, our colleague here at UCL. Um, so there's plenty of attention to hunter-gatherer research um, uh, later on in the term. And then our usual um, episode, our usual fairy tale before Christmas, the shoes that were danced to pieces, is kind of a tradition. So we're going to be very happy if we can resurrect that tradition in, in the space here. Um, are there any questions of you people feel okay, comfortable with how things are going at this point? And just to reiterate, please make sure we know that you're here so that we can get back to you if necessary. We hope it's not going to be necessary. In which case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually shut down the system so Chris can just talk um, and Chris can tell us about radical anthropology and being human, what chimps and bonobos can teach us. So I'm going to try and shut this. Okay, well it's, it's really, really wonderful to see you all. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, so, uh, yes, anthropology uh, is the study of what it means to be human um, and obviously there are, there are different ways of approaching that question and, and actually here at UCL we, we do all those things so we can ask what does it mean to be uh, a, a creature, an intelligent creature, close relatives of, our, of ours like a, a gorilla, a chimpanzee, a bonobo and we might argue that those relatives of ours are kind of almost human but maybe not quite. I'm sure the chimpanzees would think the other way around that you know we're almost chimp and, and, and you could you could play around with those thoughts um, but it, but looking at other primates gives us a, a, a kind of some leverage on the on this fundamental question and we're going to be doing that this evening um, another way of course is to ask what it might mean to be uh, an australopithecine or homo habilis or a neanderthal again looking instead of looking at closely related species, looking at different 
periods of our evolution and asking what it might have been like to be uh, in, in those times. And then, of course, there's the most familiar way, social anthropology, which is looking around the world at all the different ways there are of bringing up children, of respecting the sacred, of organising kinship, childcare, sexual relationships. Uh, and, of course, we, we, we really do need to be doing anthropology in order to get uh, into perspective the, the particular way that we in the West uh, think human life should be organised. And, of course, it's a, one of the tragedies or paradoxes, of course, is that um, in the West, in Britain and, so, and elsewhere, um, anthropology is not taught in schools. And, and I think I know the reason why. It's because um, it's felt to be important that schools function as a kind of initiation right. Children need to be initiated into this particular way of living. And they might be a bit rebellious if they, if they learn that this way is by no means the only possible way. There are so many different um, alternatives. And what tends to happen is that eventually, by the time people get to university, they're kind of allowed to know what this w weird thing, this oji is, this thing called anthropology. Uh, of course, an you know, anthropology is the one discipline which connects everything up. It connects up the natural sciences with the human sciences. And if you want to do anything properly, uh, say psychology, don't just look at you know, Western psychology, look at all the different ways there are of, 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 of structuring the mind. If you want to do sociology, don't just look at Western culture. The, that, that's just far too narrow to, for you to get any kind of perspective. Um, so pretty much any subject you can think of which has got some connection with, with, with human life and experience and psychology should be done really to be at all objective within an anthropological framework. Um, anthropology is, I say, where everything connects up. It's like the kind of Clapham Junction, all the different disciplines. It puts things together. And here at UCL particularly, we do that. So here in UCL, we have primatology, archaeology, paleontology across the road at the Institute of Archaeology, as well as social anthropology. And it's, you might think it's, that's kind of normal, but it's not. Most places where you do anthropology, you'll, if you do it at a degree level, you'll be kind of stuck in social anthropology, often rather narrowly defined, or, you, or in biological anthropology, rather narrowly defined. We, in RAG, we make a point of not doing that um, at all. So, um, the topic this evening what chimpanzees can teach us. Uh, I, I, I want to start by simply saying that um, I'm sure most of you know roughly about chimpanzees, uh, and you will have heard from so many um, studies of chimpanzees in, the, it's ch chimpanzees in the wild, ever since Jane Goodall, of course, that chimpanzees are thoroughly competitive creatures. Um, and they're also very male-dominated. Um, and you wouldn't like to be living in a chimpanzee social world. Um, it's true that some of the accounts of male dominance and violence within Gombe, the, the, the place in the far um, eastern range of, where, of, the, of, the, of the area of the chimpanzee range, it was rather extreme male dominance. Elsewhere, it's not the same at all. But still, it's not true that chimpanzees are uh, libertarian, uh, <laughs> <laughs> their social systems aren't that cooperative, um, and of course they, you know, um, very frequently it's argued. And what one of the leading primatologists um, over here, um, Richard Rangham, uh, has, has, has argued very strongly that really we are chimpanzees, and that therefore male dominance, private property, warfare, inequality, all these things are natural. They're just part of the way things are, because after all we are um, chimpanzees. Um, so, it's pretty important to know that actually, chim with common chimpanzees, the social systems, the political dynamics, vary across the, the, the areas where chimpanzees still live in, in Central Africa. They vary almost as widely, perhaps not quite as widely, as, chimp as human social systems vary. Um, so, towards the west of that range, much more flexible, Females have some degree of solidarity and power compared with chimpanzees in, in Gombe, um, and, uh, and, and in general things are rather significantly different. Um, but I, this evening I want to focus on, uh, on bonobos, um, because they, these tell us just how different um, things uh, can be. And, uh, and um, some quite extraordinary recent discoveries have shed new light on, uh, on, on these um, uh, on, on these relatives of ours. So, bonobos are a sister species of chimpanzee. 
um, and they have broadly similar life history, feeding adaptations, anatomical builds, uh, and evolved psychology as common chimps. Um, so both bonobos and chimpanzees are extremely social uh, primates. They walk on their knuckles, they eat fruit, and they are cognitively extremely um, sophisticated. Um, so just looking at the two types of chimpanzee, a good way to distinguish them is to look out for the bonobo's slightly smaller head uh, with the hair parted down um, the centre. Um, bonobos were studied in the wild quite early on, actually, by Japanese researchers from the 1970s. And it's a bit difficult to work out if, if that, given the fact that they were being, have been studied in the wild since the 1970s, how is it that origins theories, people who study human origins and hominid origins, seem to have not been aware of the bonobos? Um, in the 80s, um, uh, scholars began to be aware of the bonobos, including um, bonobos in the wild, to some extent. And um, feminists began, in opposition to um, kind of the hawks, if you like, of evolutionary theory, people like Richard Wrangham, <coughs> begin to invoke the bonobos in the critique of killer ape, uh, man the hunter uh, uh, scenarios. So Adrian Zielman was one of these uh, scholars. And she's, uh, t when she began her writings in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, she was, very, she was struck by the fact that in captivity, the bonobos showed much lower levels of aggression. Um, and then when field workers uh, began reporting on bonobos in the wild, um, to everyone's astonishment in the late 80s and early 90s, it turned out that females in this uh, closely related species had higher so social status than males. Uh, and began to be described as matriarchal um, chimpanzees. Uh, infanticide was non-existent, which was extraordinary because infanticide is a very serious problem for, for, for common chimpanzee um, mothers. Adult life was mostly playful. Well, common chimps play uh, when they're young, but when they grow up, they don't, they don't, they're not, <laughs> not playful at all. It's not that, I mean, sometimes a, an older chimp will play with a youngster but certainly you won't see two adult male chimpanzees uh, play, having a play fight with each other. If, they, if they're doing that, it will be a real fight extremely quickly. Chris, can and I just say, maybe you go a bit closer to the, just to be sure that the people on Zoom can hear you. You stand. Oh, really? Yeah, just, no, 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 don't, don't touch it, it was fine. <laughs> I just want to make sure that they can hear you. So just, if you stay a little yeah, bit can I, can, I, can I just check with everyone yeah. on Zoom? Can you hear? Is there, can you hear? Close up, but not distant. Where, where you were before, it wasn't very good. Oh, I see. Okay. Where All you right. are now is excellent. Oh, really? Oh, thanks. Thanks. Thank okay. Thanks. thanks, Annie. That's good. <laughs> Maybe a little step better. They can see you as well. But, yeah. Okay. You don't have to look at the screen, but yeah. Just okay. The right. Um, and and then finally, whereas common chimps, uh, it's often argued that they have warfare, and that's one of the things which makes warfare natural among humans. And they, they, they have a kind of warfare, there's no doubt about it. Common chimps have, have boundaries, they patrol their boundaries, uh, and quite often um, a, a bunch of chimps, male chimps, will, will, will invade uh, the, the territory of a neighbouring group. And if they come across an isolated uh, individual, male or female, but perhaps especially if it's male, they'll, they, 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 will kill, kill, they will kill this, this individual and uh, there won't be much left of it. You'll find it just a little uh, sort of layer of skin and bone and blood on the, on the ground. It's all that's left of the... Of the of, they're, 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 be stomp they're not very good at killing each other, but they do quite a thorough job when there's lots of them all piling up against uh, one. Well, it's, with bonobos, that doesn't happen. Um, there's, there's, there's no accounts, whatever, of hostile interactions between neighbouring um, territorial groups of, of bonobos. So... What I want to do this evening is to try to um, cover the explanations offered for these very radical differences between two extremely closely related um, species. And um, I think all of us in RAG are materialists uh, in this fundamental sense that we look for material factors of subsistence, demography, demography, like what the animals do and have to do because of the place where they live will determine the ways in which they relate to each other and, and will determine the forms of psychology um, they have. And it is, I would say, universally recognized among primatologists 
um, that when we're looking at the reasons for change, the factors underlying social and political change among these relatives of ours, it's the females whose foraging and reproductive strategies ultimately determine uh, what happens. So the direction of evolutionary change, change in social and political dynamics, it's, it, the females are responsible for that, whether or not females are politically dominant. And that's simply because where food is scarce, females will compete for what little there is, avoiding excessive conflict by keeping out of each other's way. Um, so, particularly perhaps in, in Gobbe Stream, where Jane Goodall did her work, the, the, it, the, it's not, the area is not rich in resources, food is relatively scarce, and the female chimpanzees need to space themselves out to avoid um, competition. Um, and they, so they forage in isolation with their, with their infants, each female protecting her offspring, while repelling any rival female attempting to invade her chosen patch. So the, the females spread out, each has got her own like cabbage patch. They have minimal relationships uh, among each other. Uh, and of course the males take advantage of that. The males um, form um, alliances, bands of brother males will, will patrol the whole area. And, they, and, and, and in the, and that area, but in other areas as well, you get e extreme male dominance which has severe costs on the mothers. And so what happens is that the females, when they come of age, when they become um, um, sexually mature, females mostly, they move out of their own territory in order to avoid harassment and coercion from a dominant male relative. They want to get out of the way, they move to another, area, another territory where they don't have any relatives. Um, and so they're isolated. Um, and uh, but, but so, but, so and you can see what's happening. The female, has had, she has problems if she stays where she is, um, but she also has problems, perhaps even greater problems, when she's moving out, because then she'll not only be uh, threatened by uh, um, uh, males in the place where she's moved, but also the females will, will resent her, her being there and, and may take it out on her. So this is um, this moving out with social anthrop anthropology, we call that patrilocal residence. Rather annoyingly, when you do primatology, you have to use slightly different terminology, and it's called, it's called male philopatry. But the point is that the males stay where they are, and the females have to move out. Uh, and there are costs to this male philopatry, this patrilocal residence, costs on the females. So a young Gombe female who tried to join a neighboring community was repeatedly attacked over a nine-hour period, often by two or three females acting together, until she eventually returned home with multiple serious wounds. In one Gombe community, around half of the females faced such hostility that they eventually chose uh, to stay at home. In a neighbouring community, one in five made this matrilocal choice. At other Gombe sites, the reported pattern was different, with over 90% of young females managing to immigrate to, uh, emigrate to a neighbouring community despite all the obstacles. Um, as if anticipating future difficulties, you have just p pictured yourself a female coming of age and need needing to make a decision. Um, what, what she will do, she will, she will wait until she feels very well fed before departing to the, to the neighbouring group um, because she will, she's going to have difficulties finding food because of all the competition. And, and I'm sure you all know female chimps have these very large sexual swellings and one of these may serve as a passport making her more likely to, likely to be valued and defended by males if threatened by resident females. But there will still be uh, dangers. On one occasion at Gombe, an immigrant mother with a small infant suffered an unprovoked attack by uh, a male. She ran from her attacker to a resident female who, instead of defending her, grabbed uh, and killed her infant. With chimpanzees, a high-ranking resident female may sometimes enter into coalition with an adult daughter to kill and eat the offspring of an immigrant, particularly if the baby in question is less than two months old. One study estimated that up to 30% of infant mortalities at Gombe were probably caused in this way, illustrating uh, the toll imposed by male philopatry on the group's prospects of re reproducing itself. Obviously, a lot of infanticide in the population means it's, it, you know, it's, it, it could be on the way to dying out. And although we may say, well, perhaps, the, uh, and has been said, perhaps, you know, perhaps these are sort of pathological circumstances, um, unusual food shortages or, or, or whatever, I think primatologists are now agreed that infanticidal attacks are neither isolated events by pathological individuals 
and nor are they mere byproducts of male aggression. They seem to be part of the female behavioral um, repertoire. So um, let's look at the bonobos, who offer a completely different perspective. They live only on the south side of a bend in the Congo River. Food there is abundant all year round. There's reduced competition for that reason, that's the materialism, and so females forage in larger groups. No male can establish his dominance, none even attempts uh, to dominate. Uh, and bonobos offer a rare example of female dominance in a great ape. They're sometimes described as co-dominant between males and females. Um, it's not always clear that the, it's a kind of matriarchy. But given that females lead, mix, they lead the mixed-sex foraging parties, so you get mixed-sex foraging parties, but the females decide where to go, and predictably the females win contests over food, we can understand why these days um, primatologists generally view them as matriarchal societies. Um, and it, I want to st stress that the, the bonobos have only been have only been a, a, have been distinct from the common chimps. They've only diverged over perhaps a million years, maybe a little bit more. But it, the genetic evidence today suggests that bonobos began diverging from chimpanzee cousins, their chimpanzee cousins, around a million years ago, and they did that when the when the, uh, the Congo River almost dried up. So the, you had the, you had no chimpanzees on the south side of the Congo River, they're all on the north side. Um, we can tell periods when the, the river pretty much dried up, making it much easier to cross. That happened about a million years ago. So along one stretch, the river became so shallow that a group of chimpanzees, nor and chip, common chimps are, are normally, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're extremely averse to deep water. They don't like, you know, they'll drown. They, managed, they must have managed to cross at this point. And when they did cross, they found themselves in wetlands, marshes, grasslands, woodlands, as well as dense, dense forage. So they found themselves in a kind of paradise. Um, so uh, another world is possible. That everything was rad radically changed. Um, and we find bonobo females are remarkably solicitous and caring of one another. Far from killing one another's infants, they take great care to ensure that no group member is disadvantaged. Each morning, when a female-led party arrives at a fruiting tree, those in the lead uh, will typically wait for the slower individuals to catch up. Bonobos will not only share food with strangers, but will help an outgroup neighbour to reach a fruit beyond their grasp, apparently without expecting anything in return. Often they will forfeit their own food in exchange for a desirable physical interaction, perhaps grooming, or perhaps, and this is what happens with uh, the bonobos, um, the, the famous Gigi rubbing. The, the, their swellings are useful for two females. Two females who find some food and might fight over it. Instead of that, they lie on their backs, they rub the genitals together, um, they, they have a good time, and then from then on, they're sort of bonded. And any male who turns up trying to get that food, he will be beaten up by those two females who, who bonded in that, in that way. Uh, and and that, I should stress as well, when two females do that, almost always they're strangers, they're not related. And in fact, you can see what's happening is that the females... Because they too, like common chimps, they male Philopatric, the females have, will have mostly moved out from their area, so they won't have sisters. They construct sisterhood by this Gigi rubbing. Um, bonobo females are welcoming toward recently arrived female immigrants. When a young immigrant female arrives for the first time in her new territory, she may confidently approach a senior resident female and apparently beg her for food, sometimes simply by taking the food from her mouth. So the immigrant just starts taking food from the, from the senior resident female's mouth. And typically the food she takes has no special value since it's found everywhere. And the, the resident female doesn't mind the food being taken from her mouth. There's plenty around. So, so there's no resistance to what might, you might think of as kind of scrounging. Um, and this behavior seemed to the primatologists who discovered it quite unexpected and quite puzzling to explain. And the primatologists who witnessed it concluded that the immigrant female was not really begging for food. She was making a bid to establish a bond, um, a request usually complied with. Um, and of course the senior female may allow this because she might benefit from a new alliance when next confronting an annoying male, which of course happens from time to time. Um, bonobo females quickly and easily form new bonds in their new community with few fears around infanticide, whereas chimpanzee females, common chimpanzee females, typically face immense difficulties from all sides, often at great cost to their reproductive uh, success. Um, so, um, 
looking over the whole field, it's important to stress that we find not only sharp contrasts between bonobo and chimpanzee gender dynamics, I've just described the contrast, almost like opposites really, opposite extremes, extreme patriarchy and quite substantial matriarchy, um, but also we find wide variation within, within each of the two sister species. Um, and the, the extreme male dominance and the extreme female isolation found by Jane Goodall among Gombe chimpanzees is actually um, unusual. So, um, in the Bodonga Forest, Uganda, food is relatively abundant. Remember, we're talking now about common chimps. Food is relatively abundant. Females do forage together, and they do form coalitions to resist aggressive males. And if approached by a threatening male, a female, again, we're talking about common chimps now, may wave her arms at him and make loud barks, prompting neighboring females to come to her assistance, joining with her in an intimidating chorus of war barks. These are these... these um, contagious rhythmic barkings and screams which can culminate in a physical attack on the male. But when a whole bunch of females emit these wah barks, these rhythmic sounds, um, the males tend to get, you know, they think, to, they think twice about the, their aggression. Um, and now I want to come to um, youngsters because the the current view, and I'm now building heavily on Brian Hare's work. Brian Hare spoke to us um, uh, last, last, last year. Um, youngsters among the bonobos are almost the, domin the dominant group. It's almost ruled by the young among the bonobos. So among chimpanzees, a young male begins entering the dominance hierarchy only when approaching adult size and reproductive age. But in the case of bonobos, quite extraordinarily, a two-year-old infant can already be exerting dominance over a powerful adult male. So despite their small size, young bonobos may have an outsized effect on interactions between adults in their community. And nothing can make a female more angry than a threat to her offspring. And this is... Uh, uh, known as the offspring defense hypothesis. How, in other words, how do you explain the fact that the youngsters among the bonobos uh, are almost the ruling group? Well, female resistance to infanticide is the underlying engine of sexual and political change in, in, the, later, in the book that, um, by um, Walker and Hare um, that, that we, were, we were introduced to uh, this, this last year. So what happens is bonobo mothers will rush to defend one another against danger to their offspring, whereas chimpanzee females tend to be highly aggressive toward outgroup females, often attacking their offspring. Their bonobo counterparts show tolerance toward immigrant females and neither threaten nor practice infanticide. Um, and so because that's such a predictable response, bonobo males have evolved to avoid upsetting young bonobos for fear of annoying their mother. At one bonobo field site, a large piece of fruit was seen to fall near the biggest adult male in the group. When it hit the ground, the male did not touch it, but instead screamed and ran off following eye contact with the infant of a high-ranking female some 15 metres away. Or at another site, having cornered a large cluster of palm fruits, an adult male was preventing some youngsters from getting close by aggressively waving his arms. And then a two-year-old infant approached. He made the male retreat, sat directly in front of the cluster, and then began slowly consuming the fruits. The infant's watchful mother was exerting her influence from a distance of over 15 metres. And then a, another important difference, which I mentioned briefly earlier, which is play. So if we look at playfulness in the two species of ape, we see another radical contrast. With chimpanzees, sex. Sex is a source of fierce competition leading to fights which get in the way of play. Um, as they reach maturity, males enjoy increasingly fewer bouts of boisterous, rough-and-tumble play. So the, they, they play when they're young, but then the hormones begin to move. And in a play fight between two young chimps, that's kind of fine, they can enjoy that, that but when, when sex comes into play, you can't afford to lose. And the, and the play fight turns into a real fight. Um, a fully grown male, common chimps we're talking about now, may sometimes let a youngster jump on his head, but his tolerance also has its limits. Adult chimps never play games among themselves, should anyone try their play fighting would quickly turn to serious violence. But bonobos are quite different. 
with no sign of fear, bonobo infants can endlessly play because the adults around them are so remarkably tolerant. The games of youngsters are often contagious, and before long, everyone else will have joined in. You see a whole bunch of bonobos, and everyone's, everyone's playing with everyone else, tumbling upside down, exploring every, every, every different part of everyone else's body. Um, and, um, and, and you can just see a radically different dynamic. Um, all primates engage in play fighting while young, looking at monkeys as well, but typically l learn to curb their boisterous and imaginative creativity on becoming sexually mature. So sex enters to stop play. Sex is too important. Sex becomes far too competitive. But with bonobos, evolution took a different course. And once playfulness was being favoured in adults, Youngsters on the verge of matur maturity would no longer have needed to curb their instincts for transgressive, mischievous uh, play. And then I want to come to possibly the most um, significant of all the differences, which is war. Um, there's a very dominant theory these days. Um, I don't think it's got too much influence in this <laughs> department. But if you ask what it, what it was in the course of human evolution which gave us this sense of we that all humans have. If, if, if there wasn't some sense of common ground, of a collective, that we do this, we do the other, um, that we have these values, you, you wouldn't even have language. Most people, I think, all, um, all, all scholars who've looked at the origin of language know that this thing called we intentionality had, was played an absolutely crucial role. Well, how did that happen? How did you get this sense of who we, as a moral community, Ah, a sense of the identity of us. Um, well, the, the dominant theory is warfare. I, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, uh, the, the idea is that if it's only when we are faced with a, a collective threat to all of us that we gel together as one moral community and you get all these references to the spirit of London, the spirit of the Blitz, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and, but the argument is that, that morality kinship, religion, all the things which define us as human emerged out of the kind of warfare um, that we know um, chimpanzee, common chimpanzees indulge in when they, when they uh, in, interact, you know, one, one group with, it, with its neighbours. Um, so it's, you, can't, you can't deny that, com that chimpanzees do um, uh, attack each other um, across their boundaries. Um, chimpanzee males often form coalitions to mount raids into one another's territory and as I mentioned earlier, typically searching for an isolated victim. The rate of killings can be astonishing. Reports from an unusually large community in Uganda describe how the males regularly patrol their community borders moving silently and in single file. Over a period of 10 years, 18 neighbours were killed or fatally wounded and three other deaths uh, were inferred by the primatologists. That implies almost 3% of the population per year, which has a mortality rate orders of magnitude greater than anything you'll find among hunter, not only hunter-gatherers, um, but, but, but other groups, um, horticulturalists, headhunters, and so on. That, that 3% death um, of the population per year is, is quite astonishing. Um, and of course, that ha you know, again, exercise uh, the toll in terms of the, you know, the sort of the demography. It's not too good to be having such a, a high, a high um, death rate. Bonobos are different. Bonobos are rarely isolated, and so the tactic of attacking a lone victim probably wouldn't work anyway. Bonobos would be able to fight back because they build their nests close to each other, sleeping overnight as a whole community and then splitting up in the morning into relatively large mixed-sex parties to go foraging. Bonobo males may sometimes form a temporary coalition to attack a single outgroup male, but they never patrol community boundaries or mount organised raids. When two adjacent bonobo groups encounter one another, the males on each side may feel anxious about their own females, but cannot prevent them from consorting with outgroup males. And perhaps I should just put this in my own words here, you've got one group of bonobos approaching another group. And if they were common chimps, the males would be fighting. And the females on either side would support, quote, their own males. It would be very reminiscent of kind of national, you know, warfare between rather small groups, of course, but still, you know, you, you think, right, this is warfare. <laughs> With the bonobos, what's astonishing is that 
it's actually reverse warfare. What happens is that the females, they're interested in the enemy males. And they know that their own males don't want them to start having relationships with the, quote, enemy males. So <laughs> what the females do is that they form alliances with the enemy females in order to attack their own males, in order to have sex with the males on the other side of the boundary. Um, I don't know how many, how many of you are familiar with the idea of international solidarity and opposition to, to imperialist wars, but this reminds me of the Bolshevik um, policy during World War I, when they were, the Bolshevism was the, was the one part of the international labour movement which was systematically against uh, war. Uh, the other parts of the labour movement, the, the so-called si si Second International, they were against war unless it was for king and country, in which case they were for it. Here, if you think in terms of the two sexes, it's kind of in some ways analogous to the you know, ruling class, working class, males not doing a lot of production, the females doing a lot of work. You can see here the, 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 the females are actually internationalists. They li they'd rather link up with their, with their sisters across the boundary in attacking their own males than, than collude in this, um, in this warfare. So instead of hostile groups of males fighting one another for possession of females, which is the chimpanzee pattern, we have females forging uh, cross-border alliances in order to enjoy sex uh, with one another's males. Have I made the point that it's rather different? <laughs> um, right, now, of course, these, these, over a period of time, political dynamics, sexual dynamics, sort of map themselves out on the body. So anatomy, physiology, reproductive physiology, over, over a period, of course, you need a long time to, for this to happen, uh, you know, the body will adapt to the dynamics. Um, so I'm just going to talk now a little bit about that. Uh, both common chimps and bonobos, the females, have sexual swellings. Um, in the case of female bonobos, these are not reliable in the sense that the, uh, the, the fact that a female bonobo has, has got a swelling does not reliably indicate that she is ovulating. Um, with, with common chimps, it's not all that reliable, but it's much less reliable. In other words, the swelling is, gives, gives away less information about the precise moment of ovulation in bonobos. Um, but even though not reliable, they are accurate enough to stimulate male arousal and mating while lo leaving room for females to influence which male gets them pregnant. The, the, different, the different numbers of males may sort of, their bodies may feel or the brains may feel that there's some possibility of getting the female pregnant, but they don't really know, and the female can use that to kind of shift the probabilities in favour of this male rather than the other male. The, the females have a, a quite, a, with bonobos, they have quite considerable freedom of sexual choice. Um, the prevailing theory is that once bonobo females could benefit from one another's presence while foraging, their swellings, initially designed to arouse and attract males, became adapted for the additional function of arousing and attracting unrelated females. So this, uh, this is pretty much the dominant consensus these days that the particular form that the swellings of bonobos take, the fact that they're larger and last longer and they're less informative about, about ovulation, is an adaptation to the lesbian uh, strategies that the bonobo females um, adopt. So the swellings of bonobos became increasing, increasingly disconnected from reproduction and used to establish bonds with either sex. Um, and all of this with the bonobos really um, is, is quite astonishing. Um, from a standpoint in Darwinian stereotypes, bonobos seem to defy every rule in the book. Um, food is frequently shared and it is females who take the initiative in this. Normally, when cooperation is found in the animal world, the Darwinian scientist's response is to invoke one of three um, theories. And I do that in my work, and Camilla does it, and we do that in RAG. But we are selfish gene theorists. We, we think genes are there to replicate themselves. It doesn't mean they make animals selfish. It just means the gene can only replicate itself. And if it starts to replicate the competition, before long, it's an X gene. But within this um, framework of modern gene-centered, or you know, gene, gene literate, if you like, Darwinism, to explain uh, cooperation, you have either kin selection, in other words, you help your own kin, so the genes will benefit from the fact that 
and similar genes, um, related, you know, closely related genes, are being assisted in the cooperation. Or if there's no genetic connection, if, if an animal is cooperating or being altruistic towards another individual who's not related at all, um, the other theory is reciprocal altruism, which is you, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Now, quite often, <laughs> neither of these theories works at all. Um, and when neither applies, the next resort might be to invoke costly signaling theory, um, which is a wonderfully powerful theory. Uh, read the book if you've got the time for it, Zahavi and Zahavi, and the handicap principle, a missing piece in, in Darwin's puzzle. And this says um, that when someone helps another, they're doing it to prove that they can afford to do this, because if you prove that you can afford to be altruistic, your status, your social status is likely to, to, to rise. But actually, bonobo food sharing can't be explained by any of these theories. When a senior resident female allows a young immigrant to take food from her mouth, she's assisting a stranger without expecting reciprocity in kind. Costly signaling cannot be the answer because the food is scattered everywhere and costs absolutely nothing to give. So something odd is going on. And I'll stop there and simply say that having crossed to the other side of the river, the bonobos somehow managed to turn upside down the core political principles of their former lives. And the question I ask myself is, um, where is that river? And, um, <laughs> and what might it take to find our way um, across? <coughs> That's it. So what happens now is, I think we have questions. Uh, costly signaling theory. Costly signaling is Zahavi. Zahavi. Am Amats Zahavi. Avishag and Amat Zahavi. It's called The Handicap Principle. A lovely book. Quick read. You read it in a day. A missing piece in Darwin's puzzle. And just to explain the principle there is, I, I don't do this nowadays because I'm, I, I just haven't anywhere near enough money. But there was a time when after rag, I used to go to the pub, and quite often I'd buy everyone a drink, or, and people would buy me a drink. And you might say, well, why does Chris Knight buy people a drink? And it's not because you're related, so that, that's knocked out. It's not because I expect you to buy me a drink, because, you know, usually people <laughs> haven't got the money to buy a drink these days, especially in the pub near here, which is very expensive. So it must be that Chris is showing off that he can afford it. And when I, had, when I was, I'm retired now, but when I was a lecturer with a reasonable salary, yes, I could afford to buy people drinks. And I, maybe at some level I was, it, it did be some good to think, yeah, I can afford to buy drinks and so I'm going to buy people drinks. <laughs> so that's the costly signaling theory. And, and it, but it's obviously it's not about human beings like in the Western society buying drinks. It's about all kinds of things that's gone on in the animal world where animals do things to sort of show off that they can afford the costs. And it's a very, very, very powerful, very good theory. Really great. It, it yeah, solves. Anthropologically, anthropologically, this is the potlatch. <laughs> yes, well done, Chris. It's very much like the potlatch. Well, it's well, how much. It's a very much. It's the surname. That, Z A H A V I. Zahavi. Z A H A V I. The potlatch is a very good example. If you're a big chief, mm -hmm. yeah. you demonstrate that you can afford all kinds of stuff. Uh, and you can sort of give it away, and it, and it raises your standing. And it's just that that principle is a very important principle in, in signalling in general in the animal world. Uh, Camilla. Um, I, I just wanted to check with the Zoom people, can you hear what's going on? <laughs> yes. Um, you can roughly hear it. So if anyone has uh, questions, yeah, just please yeah. also uh, perhaps, raise your hands. So perhaps what I should do from watch. questions here, like from Chris, I should repeat the, repeat the question. The question. Yeah, so this was, this was um, a, a question about Zahavi. I mentioned Zahavi, perhaps I slurred the words. It's Amat Zahavi and Av with his wife. Amat and Avishak Zahavi. Uh, Amat died about five or six years ago. Um, uh, and um, anyway, The Handicap Principle, a, a brilliant, wonderful book. Um, solves all kinds of mysteries. Necessary reading. Any other question? Yes. Um, uh, thank you. It's really beautiful. I, you did a really uh, beautiful job. Oh. Kind of, um, <laughs> uh, creating these distinctions between these, these, you know, these, these different types of records. Mm. Um, and, and I'm wondering, I guess, it, I guess you didn't spend a lot of time um, telling us which 
it's one where more five. Ah, right. <laughs> and I'm wondering, are you, are you, do you suspect we're like one more than the other, or are you saying we're so distinct? Mm. Why don't we pick? Right, a wonderful question. First of all, somebody actually likes the lecture I gave, thinks it was great, which is always <laughs> nice to hear. <laughs> nice comments on Zoom. And nice comments on Zoom. Okay, that's good. Um, right, and the question is, of those two very closely related great apes, common chimps on the one hand, bonobos on the other, where, are, where do I stand? Which of those two are humans most like? Um, okay, and, well, I, I, I'm fairly emphatic that I tip to the side of the bonobos, while at the same time, as you suggested, uh, indicating that actually we are extremely different as well. So, Camilla, Camilla, Camilla do you want to say something? Yep. Yeah, if okay. I, I can. Um, <laughs> I hope you can hear me. The mask. Uh, T take the mask yeah. off while you're talking, because well, we can't okay. hear you. Um, so, yeah, we've got to be really careful, because mm. we are an awful long way, many, many million years of evolution away from both yeah. chimps and bonobos. So. Mm taking them, either one of those species, as a model, specific model of a, a, you know, what, what uh, two big species call referential model, that you use yeah. one species, yeah. is, is something to be very wary of. Yeah. Um, but, but the way you were doing it in terms of the behavioral ecology of what are the material reasons why females can maintain solidarity or not, mm and thereby you can show that even chimp females yeah. are capable of solidarity in the right circumstances. Yeah. That is, is more interesting. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the other aspect of it I wanted to talk about was to talk about Richard Wrangham, hmm. who is um, a book, very interesting book, called The Goodness Paradox, hmm. not long ago. Um, and Richard Wrangham uses bonobos as a model of a process called self-domestication. Mm. And he also argues that what, who are we as homo sapiens? We are archaic humans that have self-domesticated and become modern thereby. Um, but what's really interesting about Wrangham is that where, but when with bonobos, he's arguing that it is female-driven strategy, this self-domestication. What self-domestication implies is a suppression of I instinctive defensive violence that, that, that animals respond instinctively to protect themselves violently um, and they're able to inhibit that to, to, to um, not be violent necessarily. Um, um, and Wrangham thinks bonobos did that and that's why they're so different from chimps. But in our case, he thinks it's all men that did this, and women had nothing to do with it. And this is just a peculiar position, which, which just doesn't bear relationship to the way that hunter -ga that women amongst hunter-gatherers actually have, have fantastic strategies of, of solidarity. Mm. Um, so uh, you know, we, we've got to be very careful yeah. about yeah. which That's species. right. We, d we, don't, we, don't ha we don't really want a, a model. You know, we don't want to use bonobos as, oh, this is what humans were like, like you know, millions of years ago, all common chimps. But on the other hand, unfortunately, um, the, the, <laughs> the chimpanzee model is everywhere. And, and you might wonder why we're mentioning Richard Wrangham. It's just because he is extremely influential. He's by far the most senior influential um, great ape specialist, worked with, initially with Jane Goodall, published all, all kinds of books. The, the Demonic Males was, was extremely influential, um, as, and, that, and more recently, The Goodness Paradox. And he, no question about it, he does use, um, he says we are chimpanzees, and the reasons why we are male-dominated and, and addicted to warfare is because we are chimps, and look at the chimps, this is what they what they do. And, and when I, rem I, I mentioned Adrian Zillman in the late 70s and 80s, I remember, <coughs> I remember coming across the you know, very early feminist critiques of this man the hunter, you know, warfare violence model. But I also, uh, you know, even though I knew about Adrian Zillman and others who were talking about woman the gatherer instead of man the hunter and beginning to invoke bonobos, again, I felt I, I, I didn't jump onto that bandwagon. I didn't feel right with bonobos. I, I had a feeling that something very, very strange, very, very remarkable happened with 
humans as we became egalitarian hunter-gatherers. And for me, what happened was, was revolutionary. It's not like we've been egalitarians. I mean, perhaps every, every, is it clear to everybody um, today, extant immediate return hunter-gatherers, hunter-gatherers who don't do storage, are remarkably sophisticated egalitarians. They're, they're extraordinarily clever and sophisticated at making sure that no one gets above themselves. And gender um, solidarity is powerful, and, and they're, they're gender egalitarian as well. And but when, I, when I began to find out about all this in the late 60s and 70s, I wasn't necessarily thinking, right, the reason we are egalitarians is because of the egalitarian chimps or bonobos. Something very, very special and remarkable must have happened in the course of human evolution. But it was, as Camilla's suggesting, it was something to do with domestication. So, but, and it's just so, for me, it's just so surprising that Richard Wrangham is able to assert and be apparently believed in saying that, yes, we are, we humans are a, a domesticated chimpanzee, but it wasn't females that domesticated us. I, I find, I find how, and then he says we domesticated ourselves. And by we, he means we men managed to domesticate ourselves. And I just find that whole idea really quite astonishing, especially given that Wrangham is one of the founders of this basic principle I mentioned earlier, which is that it's what the females do in any, not just primate species, with mammals in general, it's whether the females disperse or aggregate, whether the food is on the, up in the trees or on the ground, what the, what the females do to find food to feed their offspring determines everything else. So it, given that Wrangham himself was the, one of the founders of that whole theory, which has now become totally accepted by everybody, how can, it be, how, can, how can it be that females played no role and somehow we managed to domesticate ourselves? And it just seems to be obvious that we are, this is one more example of a very unfortunate thing, which is that um, you know, what's, what's supposed to be science gets far too heavily influenced by, by politics. Um, uh, you know, and uh, it should be the other way around. Any decent politics will be fundamentally informed by science instead of, instead of the wrong way around. And I hope I, I mean, your, your question is a huge one, and you've got to sort of follow, you've got to, you've got to you know, follow this a bit, because possibly next week I'll come on to what I think happened. But perhaps I'll just say one thing, which is that I, I mentioned male for the patri, you know, females having to move out, whether they're chimps or bonobos. And when they move out, they've either got no relationships or they've got to manufacture relationships through GG rubbing. We in RAG are convinced that, uh, we don't quite know the dates exactly, but some, some immediately preceding the, the transition to hope, genus Homo, Homo erectus, maybe two million years ago, females achieved a remarkable switch towards living with mum. Females began to refuse to move out, stick with their mum, stick with their sisters, and that gave them a different kind of solidarity from the solidarity that the bonobos have to have through GD rubbing. Um, but it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a big argument. Yes. I guess kind of still on this topic, I'm curious about, because it seems like based off of what you were describing, like the difference between the common chimps and the bonobos is like this kind of abundance, right? So yeah. Some form of currency. Yeah. So I'm curious if there have been any like correlations between like the human like class system and like the way that females relate and kind of like, or male dominance. <laughs> I don't know. That is like a struggling. Yeah. But maybe not. No, 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 I mean, it's, it's Camilla's subject and many of our, our, our subjects, I mean, absolutely, quite, quite right. I mean, there's a huge controversy right now because there, are, there is a whole school of thought um, which is quite left-wing, anarchists, libertarian communists, David Graeber, David Wengro, who say that these... It, Questions of gender dynamics and political I'm dynamics. Asking to repeat the question. Can we oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Continue. Okay. Yes, the question is, um, I've argued that with, with chimps and bonobos, what determines gender relationships, political dynamics, sexual dynamics, is abundance or scarcity. And the question is, do I think the same applies to human females? Uh, is, it, is it the case that where we get um, relatively... Um, strong, intense bonds between women and, and gender solidarity between women, relative egalitarian, you know, gender egalitarianism, do we think that that too reflects material circumstances? The answer is yes. <laughs>
but it would take, you know, take a, come, come for the next year or so, <laughs> and, and, we'll, and hopefully you'll be convinced that we have some good answers. <coughs> next week. Yeah. Next week yeah, as well, next yes. Next week we'll be yeah, yeah. touching on those topics, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um. But abundance is crucial. Scarcity is, al is always terrible. Scarcity always produces competition and conflict. Um, yeah. Ah, oh, yes. So um, I wanted to go back to the, what was perhaps the most disturbing thing in the talk, which was about the female infanticide in mm. chimpanzees. So I'm, mm. you know, I'm familiar with the male infanticide yeah. in langurs and, yeah. and chimpanzees, mm. but I hadn't really heard about female infanticide, and I just wondered if you can say more about the circumstances in which that occurs, because it seems a very sort of anomalous it, it is it is absolutely shocking if you're a human you know watching this doing field work to you know to see it in front of your eyes it's extremely distressing i mean you've you've mentioned sarah hurdy's um work with male infanticide um and she you know emotionally it's very difficult for us to sort of not in, want to intervene and stop it all because our whole all our our, our evolved psychology is, is if you like so different um but yes i mean it's uh, it's scarcity there's no question about that um uh, I don't know how to elaborate without going into sort of more detail. I mean, Jane Goodall was the one who first discovered it. Um, um, uh, I've got plenty of references here <laughs> at the bot bottom of my notes here. Um, what to, how do I answer um, to say f more about this? I mean, it's, 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 it's just so clear that the, f the female young chimp who needs to move out is moving into a place where which has all been parceled up. All the the other groups, females, have all got their, their boundaries around their relatively small cabbage patches that they move around in with their offspring if they've got them to find food. And food is scarce. And you don't, if food's scarce, you don't want somebody else coming in taking a, a portion of it. So it's kind of understandable why the females would be hostile. But I, I agree that when you look at the details of the ferocity of those attacks and the fact that the females might link up with their own kin and, and not just kill the infant but eat it, I suppose, you, I suppose while, it's, while it's, when it's dead, you might as well eat it. Um, there are all kinds of <laughs> arguments around that. But, it, but I, I'm, 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 you know, I haven't done that field work myself. Obviously, I'm just citing the reading I've done on this and, and what I've heard from, he, from here. Females, when they, it's when the young, a young female moves into a new group. Mm. Which she has to do, pretty much. Yeah. Except, except I, will, I, will, I will stress as well, sometimes, with, even at Gombe, sometimes a female kind of refuses to move. She sort of moves out, maybe doesn't like it, she's getting attacks from the resident females there, or whatever, and she comes back. Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier, if she comes back to her own place, the danger is her father or, bro or older brother, dominant to her, will then harass her sexually, and sometimes a, a, an older male, a brother, will rape um, a, a female with common chimps, and there's not much the females can do about it. But, uh, but, but there, are, there are occasions, there are examples, and Jane Goodall was, you know, started this whole story, it's, her, it's Fifi. She's got the world record for <laughs> offspring. So she's a female who stayed at home, stayed with her, her mother, was successful in doing that, had, had offspring. They, the females themselves stayed um, with, with mum. You get a matrilineage, and it's actually those females among common chimps in Gombe of all places who have the world record for numbers of surviving babies. <laughs> so that's part of the reasoning I have for suggesting that hominin females took that move and managed to, to stay with mum. And that would then fit in with other things, like, for example, the grandmother hypothesis, which is the hypothesis that explains the menopause. You know, that, that women who live with their daughter and can look after their daughter's offspring actually do better doing that than having babies themselves at their age. Camilla. Um, I do just wanted to add um, that uh, in that case of the chimps, the F, the famous Fifi family, Flo family, mm. their sons yeah. became the absolute alpha males. Yes. They were the very dominant yeah. males. But also in bonobos, yeah. mothers are making bonds with incoming females because mm. they're lining up mates for their sons. Yeah. So in both those cases, mm. whether mm. you get these kind of matriarchs 
it's influencing sons' reproductive success in enormous amount. Mm, mm, mm. Um, there was one other interesting um, thing I wanted to bring in too, because there's just very recently come up a genetics paper on chimps and bonobos, which is, even though we're talking about this river being impenetrable for like a million years, mm. actually there has been some genetic admixture of bonobos going into chimp country something like half a million years ago. Oh. And there is a, a genetic um, trace of this introgression by bonobos into chimps. All right. So right. bonobos maybe went to make, well, they were maybe had their internationalist strategy where they even grabbed hold of some male chimps. On the other side well of the river. On the other side of the river. Yeah. Um, so it's quite, a, it's quite an interesting paper, that one, mm. from the perspective Oh, my God, yeah. Here. yeah. yeah. No, I, I had no idea of that. Knowing about it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, 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 definitely. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, three or four years ago, it was thought that the, there, were, there were several times the rivers dried up, and three or four years ago, it was it was believed that the genetics indicated the divergence of common chimps from bonobos two million years ago, and in the last eighteen months, it's it's, it's shifted, and it's only one million years ago. So it's ex and as Camilla pointed out, we have we we humans hominins have diverged from the ancestors of the chimps, the common ancestor of all of us, about six or seven million years ago. I think people are beginning yeah. to think seven, actually. But we, which yeah, is, which, but there's mm. reticula there is the reticulation, mm. like it keeps flowing back in yeah. quite yeah. a bit yeah. with yeah. both chimps and gorillas. Okay, I, I didn't um, know about that. Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Right, yes. I must remember to repeat the question when you've yeah, said it for the, the, for the Zoom. We should also ask if Zoom people have yeah. any. We've got a huge number of people on Zoom, yeah. ten times as many yeah. as here, yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. argument that uh, if you look at hunter-gatherer societies, they're incredibly anti-egalitarian because they have what he calls the first dominance hierarchies. Mm. So he argues that we have a chimpanzee-like first common ancestor, and as a result of being able to form, uh, form the first dominance hierarchies, this created the basis for uh, the evolution of modern human cognitive characteristics, like theory of mind, and the intentionality of movement. But his argument, his political argument, is that once you get into large societies, um, it's, it's hard to have this kind of reverse dominance hierarchy where our kind of chimpanzee-like tendency mm -hmm. to form, to, at the same time we, we are cooperative, we have a chimpanzee-like tendency within us at the same time to, to dominate each other and to, to form hierarchies and so on. And when you have large societies, that's what comes out um, when you try to have utopian projects or present communism and so on. So right. It can be what, it's going to be very hard for me to repeat that question, so correct me if I get it wrong. That was like a bit of a more, this is a more no, no, Okay, a, there is a very important book. You can, everyone should probably read my book, Blood Relations, but there's a, which is a, you know, about the origins of, of culture. But another book, which is an easier read and probably more successful, is um, Christopher Boehm's wonderful book, Hierarchy in the Forest. Um, and that argues, as you're saying, um, that uh, our... Ancestors were probably rather like chimpanzees in the sense that they had quite vertical dominance hierarchies. Um, and so you get a pyramid, a few alpha males, subordinate males, blah, 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 uh, females at the bottom. And, and, and what he argues is that hunter-gatherers aren't just, they don't, they're not just tolerant, it's not just that they get on with each other, it's not just that they're cooperative, it's, it's that the entire dominance hierarchy or pyramid has been turned upside down so that the, the collective is at the top and the, and the would-be alphas are at the bottom of the hierarchy, reverse dominance. Didn't quite explain what triggered that, I don't think. And it's a huge problem in my view, which means that my book's far better, <laughs> which is that um, he completely ignores gender. There's nothing about it at all. You don't know who, we have this reverse. What he argues is that primate coalitions uh, come in two kinds, really. Those, those which um, assert dominance and those which resist dominance. And to get reverse dominance, you've got to have a coalition of everybody. And a coalition of everybody is only going to come from below. 
And it, apparently it happened, and hunter-gatherers, you know, they, they give us a good example of that. And, and in fact, all hunter-gatherer and eventually human religion, kinship, morality, and so on, is, is the dominant of the collective over the, over the individual. But as you were saying, he argues that our psychology remains ambivalent, and we, we are all too ready to switch back to dominance because that's a part of our evolutionary past. And when you get, when you get a large um, you know, community, maybe today, it's very difficult for reverse dominance to be managed or to be successful, and we sort of revert back to our chimpanzee you know, norms or instincts, if you like. And, and you're arguing, asking what I, what I think about that. Well, I, 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 I now probably, I've, I've always thought there's a huge problem because we need to know, we need to know something about those who are dominant and those who are resisting. Are there, are, is the resistance coming from mainly females? Is it female-led resistance? Where's the sexual dynamic? He talks about sex when it's dealing with chimps, but when it comes to the, the revolution, if you like, the, the switching over from dominance to reverse dominance, suddenly sex and gender completely disappear. And it's hard to know why, except I know people get worried about sex and get worried about, like Wangham does, you know, people get worried about <laughs> talking about women's solidarity. It seems to be a, a difficult topic. But my own view now, especially since in the last four or five years, I've become so much more familiar with the bonobo material, is to see that actually it's just as likely that, it, and you've asked about the last common ancestor, it's just as likely that the, 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 um, the bonobo psychology is implanted in us and as part of the way we are as the common chimp. Um, uh, as for your question, the, so the question was, just to repeat it, what do I think about the last common ancestor? I presume you mean going right back, um, you know, six, seven million years ago. Well, um, I mean, these were little creatures this high, weren't they? They were coming out of the trees. I'm, by the way, Rangham has w one brilliant thing about him recently. He's adopted the aquatic ape hypothesis which I think is absolutely right. He, he argues that, that the, 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 the six, six or seven million years ago, when our hominin ancestors began moving out of the forest, they did not stride into the hot, dry savanna. They moved into areas of wetlands, marshes, river bends, uh, and, and uh, you, you'll drown if you can't you know, begin to get upright. And he, he, he argues that that's the reason for the, the initial kick towards um, bipedalism, is, is moving around in shallow water, wading, and foraging for you know for shellfish and lily bulbs and, and, and all that stuff, so but but I mean these are I, who knows I, I mean <laughs> I have no idea what their psychology was really, um, but we need to think of something to say. <coughs> um, yeah, yeah, go on, Camilla. Just to say, yeah. uh, it's obviously the sixty-four million dollar question. This really question, um, but because of the much better uh, understanding of the similarities and differences of the pan species, chimps and bonobos, we really want to look at the early hominins and think that there must have been an array of possible different um, you know, lineages that were doing things very differently in different mm. ecologies. And there are people who will put out, I mean, we're, we're really interested in what are, what are Australopithecines like, what are Ardipithecus. There are some people who will argue that actually with Ardipithecus, we could think of them somewhat in, in watery, swampy types environments um, with a tendency to be more bonobo-like than to be chimpanzee-like. There are people who will argue that sort of thing. Then there's the Owen Lovejoy people who will say, oh, Ardipithecus has already got monogamy going, which is very doubtful if they were <laughs> bonobo-like at all. Um, but I, I tend to go with, I, I tend to go with an argument that there's still a kind of great ape-like retention of females moving out mm. until where, where the pressure for really a big switch there will come with the increase of brain size which doesn't really happen until two and a half million three two and a half million two <coughs> million years and um, and then i follow a line of argument with people like <coughs> sarah hurdy that what is it that really kicks off genus homo is the issue of cooperative child care because mm. even bonobos know despite the fact that females are very supportive of each other, protecting from male violence against offspring, they're still not doing babysitting in the ways that we can see with monkeys. So great apes don't do that. They don't do collective childcare, except us, we do. So we're kind of the, the mm. one there. But 
mm. that, that's an arguable. So the, the switch into a female tendency of philopatry with mother and, and her mother, mother and grandma, um, part of genus homo strategy, perhaps. Mm. That's right. Who knows, it may be older. I, I definitely think that the switch to living with mum triggered everything. But, it, but of course, that, as Camilla said, that itself had to be triggered. There had to be some reason for that. And, and the fact is, mum, if, you've got, if you're a woman, or an evolving human female, hominid, if, you've got a, if you're pregnant or, or in childbirth, who do you need? Your mum. She is the most reliable assistance. And it's extraordinary the way in which uh, chimpanzee females have to give birth completely on their own without any... So we talk about cultural transmission in chimpanzees, and it's true that they pass on traditions of tool use. What they cannot pass on is wisdom of childcare because, you know, because the female who's giving birth or, or, or beginning to suckle the baby, the infant, she hasn't got a mum. Nothing gets passed on. The, the fact that the female has to move out sort of interrupts the chain of cultural transmission, which anyway, to the extent you do get cultural, cultural transmission with common chimps or bonobos, if it's something about how to how to bring a big stone, put a nut on top of it, you know, put, put a nut on a, you know, on an anvil, smash it. With all those, all those technological traditions, they get passed on not from father to child, always invariably from mother to, to daughter or son. So you break that transmission by, by forcing the females to move out all the time away from mum. Can you see how limiting, what a block on cumulative cultural evolution it would be to be having to move out all the time? Uh, whereas switching to living with mum would suddenly liberate cultural transmission and, and learning. Put on, in, in the most, there's nothing more important than childcare from the point of view of, of your own fitness, uh, but even from the point of demography, like the, 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 the long-term historical survival of a community, childcare comes first, and living with mum would have done wonders to that. <coughs> Anyone on Zoom with questions? Well, I have a question in the chat. I've right here in the chat. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Camilla. Well, what is the question? <laughs> uh, wait, uh, oh, Who is oh, that? There's a question Callum, on the chat. Callum, it's what, about... What, the... can we, what can we learn from the patrol of a perimeter? Does the, does the sun and foliage affect this development? And does this have anything to do with language development? What can we infer from patrolling your perimeter, which is exactly what common chimps do? Is it to do with foliage? And being able to see, I think you mean that, being able to see where the perimeter of the boundary is and, and look across yeah. it. And has that got anything to do with language? Uh, <laughs> oh dear. Um, right. Um, I've never, s I haven't thought too much about, about that issue of exactly where you draw a boundary. But I would, th I would agree with you that out, out, in the, out in the open, with either savannah or mixed waterside ecology, you, I think you're implying it would be a little bit difficult to know quite where the boundary is, whereas in relatively dense rainforest, just possibly you're making a point there where it's easier to know where the boundaries is, are. I, I suppose I can, I can sort of see that. Um, but, um, I mean, given that bonobos live in also in a rather similar rainforest areas, albeit with more abundant resources and don't have boundaries and warfare, I'm not sure how much that argument's going to hold. I would think other factors about abundance and female aggregation and dispersal probably have more to do with whether males can get away with this kind of um, violence directed at their neighbours. As for whether it's got anything to do with language, uh, well, I'm, writing a, I'm trying to write a book on this question with um, my, my colleague here at UCL, um, Jerome Lewis. And um, yes, I mean... What I think about language is that there can be no such thing as a theory of its origin. You can't explain the origin of language outside of a theory of everything which made us human. And one of the reasons for saying that is that language wouldn't work under certain cir social circumstances and would work under, under others. For language to work, you have to have quite a lot of trust because words can easily be lies. So I suppose, answering your question, in, in a situation where you've got warfare on that small scale with males lining up to attack each other's females, probably rape them, and all the conflicts you're going to get going on, I'm, I'm sorry, you're not going to get language. You need a, you need a relative stability, relative stable tr levels of uh, qu quite intense, intense trust right across a whole community 
to have optimal conditions for this thing called language to flourish. Uh, it's a big argument, and we'll have to get into all that um, another time. But thanks for the question. They're interesting. Good one. Thanks. Good. Right, yeah. Cheers. Any more Zoom questions? Oh, yes, at the back. Right. Sorry, here's one here. Is that all right, Camilla? Yeah, okay, yes, hello. Uh, yeah, firstly, I'd just like to echo that, Camilla, that's great. Um, my question is, it may be a bit for you to tie into coming out, but um, would you be able to link, like, so you know the classic difference model, so like, Deborah Tannen, uh, men of Mars, women of Venus, that sort of thing. Um, it's maybe really tenuous again, but like, could there be something in the fact that the matriarch, matriarchally organized bonobos, how they sort of evolve in our society around this sort of notion of solidarity <coughs> against the more, uh, the more patriarchal dominated um, chimpanzees and them being very much dominated by hierarchical males. Hierarchical males. Could we see something there, and, uh, like, at least in terms of behaviorally, is there a parallel somewhat? Well, uh, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Okay, I've got to try and repeat the question. Um, um, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Is that the one? Okay, I mean, there's no question that females and males, uh, from a Darwinian point of view, have different reproductive strategies, always will, and there never, there's no reason to assume they're in harmony with each other. You know, females have got so many eggs, rather limited, can only produce a certain number of babies. Males have got very cheap sperm. If you're dominant, you can, you, you can produce <laughs> almost an unlimited number of offspring. So there's going to be that conflict between the sexes unless something's happened to minimise the levels of e explicit conflict. Um, but I'm not quite sure what your question is. Uh, um, but let me just perhaps answer it in a quick way by saying that w one of our speakers will be later this term is Morna Finnegan. Um, and she has developed a wonderful theory, having done field work in Africa among, among the Bayaka, the Benjeli, the same people that Jerome Lewis here um, studied. And she just noticed, from, partly from her own work, but, but also from her reading of neighboring hunter-gatherer groups, she noticed a, a pendulum. She noticed that what tends to happen is you don't have a matriarchy, because when women take the power, which they do, through, a, a, like in the case of the Benjeli, they have a thing called um, Ngoku, it is a raucous, powerful women's ritual where they invade the men's space and they make fun of the men, they're very s provocatively sexual, they tease and taunt the men. But after a while, once the women feel they've made their point, they get a bit tired of it and they, you know, call it all off and life returns to normal for a while until finally, after a few days perhaps, or perhaps you know, a week or two, the men decide to stay in a jengi when the men answer back with their brawn, their muscle, their, you know, they're, they're, they're stopping about being, you know, being men. And then, but then, of course, you get this pendulum. The, the women rule, the men rule, the women rule, the men rule. And the women, the women wouldn't, be, wouldn't feel provoked to stage their, their nagoku were it not for the potential threat that the men's dengue could get out of hand. It could, oh, the men's, with their ritual, they could outstay their welcome. So precisely because the men stage a jengi, women feel the need to reverse, it's a bit like reverse, it is reverse dominance by the way, it's the same thing. R women reverse a jengi with nagoku, but then the men reverse nagoku with a jengi, so actually reverse dominance is great, but unlike Bohm, who has a sort of static model of reverse dominance, Morna has this brilliant insight, it's, and she calls it communism in motion. The, w the women take power, get fed up with it, let the men have a go, the men take power, get fed up with it, let the women take a go. And, and, and the way of putting it is to say that it, if we want to sort of use that as a kind of model for what might work with us, who knows? I mean, I don't know if anything will work with us at the state we're in at the moment of the world, but anyway, <laughs> it would be to like, know how to seize power and seize power to such an extent that you're prepared to surrender it knowing that you can seize power again. So that's, uh, that's what she means by communism emotion. The women seize power in a very thorough way and are confident that they can let go and let the men take over because the women know right. And actually, this is, I think this was originally linked with the moon. Next new moon, we'll be back seizing power again, and you get this pendulum of power. So that's what I think. <laughs> and I think in RAG, more and more of, us, more of us are coming to the same conclusion with Morna on that. It's a lovely idea, isn't it? That, you know, instead of having a system, 
you have a kind of playful to and fro between all the different forces at work and everyone gets their chance but no one's allowed to take the piss or you know outstay their welcome uh, and, and I, when I think about that I just think wow has patriarchy outstayed its welcome it has it's, it's, it is really taken the piss I'm afraid especially now <coughs> Any more questions here or questions on Zoom at all? Um, uh, oh, so weird. Um, okay, Leon Hart here is asking Is the longer ovulation of bonobos um, to do with greater resources? That's the complicated <laughs> question. That is t a tough one. It's going to really—it's uh, well, not a, just to say yeah, it's yeah. not a longer ovulation. Yeah. It's a confusion of when is the time of ovulation. It's a longer estrus signal that goes through most. So a bonobo, unlike a chimpanzee, can have sex through nearly all its estrus cycle. That's more similar to humans, in fact, except that we humans don't really have estrus. So. I would, um, but uh, is it to do with greater resources? Yeah. So I would say yes, in the sense that um, it's the great, it's the more abundant resources which enables the females to bond with each other. Um, they use the um, more drawn out and less honest, if you like, um, estrus swellings to bond, to GG rub with each other. Um, and so yes, I mean yes, ultimately there is a connection between the um, the kind of estrus swellings, sexual swellings the bonobos have, and the and and the abundance, the economic abundance, there is a connection. Yes. Um, I mean, perhaps just to draw, a con it's always nice to draw a contrast as long as you don't get too binary with these contrasts. But uh, but um, the, the, when when you get an when you get some I don't know certain kind of baboons, um, hamadryas baboons, for example, you tend to get a, a one or two dominant males. Usually, actually, ends up being one dominant male over a whole harem of females and the females they only need sperm from the male really they're not going to get f annoyed with a male for ha you know getting them pregnant and then getting someone else pregnant and what then happens is that it that the females have a good reason to sort of save time on sex um, and in order to save time on sex they give a relatively clear indication of when they're ovulating so that the alpha male can have can impregnate this female and then this one and then this one and then this one. So if females only need sperm from the male, it might pay them to save time on sex by giving the dominant male the time-saving information. But if, as we think in the, happened with humans, human females could actually make use of males for more than just sperm and get them to help a bit and invest a bit of time and energy, then every female needs at least one male. So I'm, and the way I put this is to say males are useful things to have. Everyone needs at least one of them. So now you need to waste time on sex. And the way you waste time on sex is by not giving away any time-saving information and, and extending receptivity throughout the cycle. You know. And to, to an extent, that's where, where bonobos have got. But actually, human females have gone far, much further down that road, not in the sense of swellings, of course, but in the, t in the sense of uh, the human female really thoroughly confuses the male. The, the human female has really... The human female is really, you could, I hope everyone understands me when I say this, you could argue that the human female is the biggest time waster on the planet. I mean, she, she makes it hardest for the male to save time on sex in order to, you know, be a roving male, get num numerous different females pregnant in turn. By, by forcing the male to hang around, because he doesn't know when the moment is, the human female has actually maximised the, the amount of time a male has to spend. And once you spend a large amount of time on one female, He's invested it already, and he might as well hang around and help with the baby as well uh, in later life. So uh, the, the astonishing thing with humans is the extent to which the human male is a brilliant dad. I mean, obviously, not always a brilliant dad. dad dads are, you know, they, they vary between hero and zero, as, it's, as, 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 as Camilla has put it. Put it in. But I mean, um, by comparison with the other great apes, the human male is an extraordinarily brilliant dad, but it's thanks to the female um, that he's become that. Um, and, and part of that is actually evolving um, a cycle which makes it difficult for the male to save time on sex. 